Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to um, Uncharted Waters, Navigating Uncertainty. Uh, I'm Vivian Corwin. I'm a professor here at the Gustafson School of Business. I teach human resources and organizational behavior. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome today Lauren Alexandra, who's a recent graduate of the Masters of Global Business program here at Gustafson, and also the founder and owner of She Can Consulting. So um, some of you may have seen some of the other Uncharted Waters uh, webinars that we've been running. Uh, this series is a little bit different in that it's primarily aimed at students. Uh, we understand there's a lot of you who are just finishing up or just entering into a university and obviously all of the uncertainty that's engulfing us all at the moment must be a particular concern to those of you that are just starting out or just finishing up. And we wanted to have an opportunity to explore with some recent graduates uh, from our programs how they are managing this particular situation, how they've dealt with uncertainty in the past and advice that they might have for you. Um, as you either finish up or, or begin uh, your, your programs here. Um, so looking ahead and not knowing can be a difficult position for all of us. So we thought that we would, we would draw on the expertise of, these, of these, uh, these recent graduates to find out how they've handled it all. Um, so Lauren, I'm delighted to have you here. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Lauren graduated from MGB. As I said, she uh, studied in Canada, the Netherlands and Peru as part of that program and has since then has started her own consulting business. Lauren, can I turn it over to you to tell us just a little bit more about how you got to where you are now? Yeah, you bet. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, in terms of how I got here, I would probably start my journey in 2017. I was working for a large corporation in Vancouver. I was next in line to be managing director and life had a different plan for me. However, I was in a really serious car accident, which caused me to be off work for almost a year um, and resulted in a separation from my long-term partner while still on bed rest. So feeling pretty defeated from that, I chose to see that uncertain time as an opportunity to self-reflect and to grow. And so by doing that, I asked myself, what is it that makes me happy? And that's when I realized that I absolutely adore learning and some of my best life experiences have been when I traveled. And that's what made me want to apply for the MGB program. So after going through the program, I started thinking about my next steps and I just couldn't bring myself to apply for another corporate job. I remember the moment so vividly. Um, I was in Cuba in a cab on my way to Havana and I was reading a book called You Are a Badass by Jen Sincero. If anyone hasn't read it, I strongly recommend doing so. Um, and it was in that moment that I decided I am a badass and uh, I am ready to go on on my own and enough is enough and I'm going to start my own business. And 17 months later, here I am. Wow. Excellent. In, yeah. In terms of, kind of what I do, um, I empower women to conquer their personal and professional goals through one-on-one -on -one coaching, through group coaching and through mastermind facilitation. Um, I also help professionals. Um, with their resume development and I consult on interview preparation. In my first year, I did a little bit more of business consulting than I did coaching, but now just because it's more lucrative, but now that my book of business has grown with my coaching clients, I focus a little bit more on that end. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. So it's an interesting path that you've taken to get there. And clearly um, you have, you learned uh, in a challenging circumstance that things are not always as linear as we as we expect them to be. Um, these last months must have been imposing some particular challenges of their own now um, as the founder of a relatively young business. I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about um, some of the most pressing challenges that you faced in the past couple of months and how you dealt with them. Sure. I faced as an entrepreneur lots of challenges daily. Um, I would say my most recent, I have two examples that kind of come to mind. So I would say that my most recent challenge was when COVID hit and people were starting to get laid off and it all started with my clients canceling their contracts, um, whether consulting or coaching, um, which obviously they just, they had to make a choice and reallocate their finances, which I understood. But with that said, that obviously impacted my income tremendously. So initially I struggled with the idea of continuing to market my services because I didn't want to come off as insensitive. Um, but I quickly realized that I had a choice to make and I could either sit back 
and you know accept government subsidies and just kind of lay low um, and not do anything to really progress or I could pivot my strategy and my approach and lean into the uncertainty by doing what I do best and that's serving others. So now more than ever, people are interested in coaching and are looking for additional support. So why at a time of need, wouldn't I be there to support my target market? And that was sort of the mindset I had with it. And it's proven to be the right choice. The, the other example that comes to mind uh, since starting my business that I didn't anticipate, but quickly realized was a true reality was having to break up with clients. <laughs> I, I never knew that would be a thing, and it is a real thing. Um, it's really important to work with people uh, that you have value alignment with. Particularly when you're, when you're coaching, you wanna work with people that you have a good click with. When you're consulting, you wanna work with people who share the same value alignment. Um, change is already challenging enough. So then going in and working with people on their development and working with others on their business you, you really need to have that alignment. So doing a really good discovery at first was a hard lesson that I had to learn. And regardless of the amount of money that I was offered, um, I had to make a choice of, did I want to associate myself with this company and this person and their values and how they see managing a company? Or do I need to stick to my core values and choose to not work with them? So as a startup, that was a really challenging decision because it was my biggest contract I'd ever landed. Mm -hmm. um, but after three months, I decided to, to move on. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, lots of, lots of experience there to draw on clearly. Um, so, um, what strikes me in listening to the way that you've talked about both those situations, um, is that, that you were, you were faced with a difficult challenge, but that ultimately the answer that presented itself to you was clear. Right. There was there was not a lot of equivocality about it, that that once you um, once you thought through the decisions that you had to make, you had a pretty clear understanding of your path forward. And you and I have talked before um, about the importance of understanding your own why as a way of making these kinds of decisions and keeping going when things get difficult. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you think about the importance of understanding your own why and what that means to you? Absolutely. So regardless of what you want to do with your life, this concept applies to you. However, if you're an entrepreneur or if you're wanting to start your own business one day, then this is something that I would strongly encourage you to start thinking about and working on identifying. So I always ask my clients what their why is. So everybody needs to have a hard why. So when you're chasing a dream, you will encounter challenges that will make you want to quit and that will make you want to give up. So having a strong why is what's going to propel you forward every single day and help keep you motivated. So this why is more important than the how. Most people are so worried about the how, like how am I going to start a business? How am I going to get that promotion? It's less about the how and it's more about the why. The how comes with action and you do end up figuring it out. Um, but you need to have a why to keep you motivated and not quit. So for example, my why is that I want to be example for women everywhere and to empower them to believe that they can achieve anything that they are willing to work for. This doesn't mean that I don't support men. I absolutely do. Um, I don't discriminate. And who knows, maybe she can, we'll have a he can division one day. But for right now, the focus on women is what makes my why so powerful and strong for me. So you need to want a why that is so hard it doesn't matter how much struggle or financial loss or long hours or failures that it takes to kind of go through in order to achieve your dream mm -hmm. so your why needs to outweigh the hurt that you will inevitably experience when you're trying something new mm -hmm. and there's a reason why most people aren't successful entrepreneurs and it's because you need to be willing to go through the fire <laughs> it's um it's important to mention that your why doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to be something like ending world poverty or coming up with a coronavirus cure, um, but it can't be something materialistic. So for example, if you're saying like my why is because I just want to be rich or I just want to make my own schedule, mm -hmm. um, it's probably not going to help you. If your why is comfort, 
you won't be willing to go through the discomfort required to get you to a comfortable place to live. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So when we think about understanding our why, I've often thought that that's something that becomes clearer to us as we get older, as we have more life experience uh, to deal with. Um, a lot of the people that, that might be listening to, now, to us now are younger. Um, and I've wondered though about this particular time that we're in, um, this, this jolt that everybody around the world is suddenly experiencing. If that might not be a, a way of, of helping people identify their why, that, that despite the sort of particular challenges that we're facing now, this might actually be an opportunity for people to get a clearer sense of, of what the why is because the regular path they were on uh, may not be an option anymore. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think that being adaptable is really key and being willing to be flexible um, with almost everything aside from, you know, your why, your core values, those fundamentals that really matter. But outside of that, I mean, business trends change, business strategies change. COVID, for example, I had to shift, I had to pivot my approach. Um, so you have to be willing to look at circumstances and adjust with them as they change. And the better and more comfortable you are at adjusting when required, the less challenges you're going to face. Mm -hmm. Um, because often sometimes just the fact that you have to adjust is the challenge when ultimately it doesn't need to be. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like the being willing to, to make adjustments, even with your goals, with your why, your why will change over time. Mm -hmm. um, and that's okay. It's just a matter of having it hard and focused in that moment. Okay. Thank you. Did that answer, did that answer your question? It does. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Um, Another particular challenge at this current time is that on the one hand, everyone's very constrained in what we can do. A lot of options have been shut off for us. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of other options may have opened up and in, in some ways can appear, appear infinite because there is so much change um, and so many possibilities that, that might seem to open up once another set of possibilities close. Um, what's some advice you have on dealing with this uncertainty and this possibility in a way that doesn't overwhelm us or impede our ability to actually make good decisions? That's a really good question. <laughs> Um, I'll start by saying that uncertainty is just a feeling and feelings are a result of our thoughts. So when you can learn to manage your thoughts, your feelings will change. So there's a lot to kind of unravel there, but keep that in the forefront of your mind that uncertainty is just a feeling. So for this particular situation with COVID-19, for example, this is a situation that's been presented to us that's completely out of our control. You know, we didn't cause COVID-19. Um, we can't fix COVID-19. That's out of our hands. It's something that we don't have control over. So when it's, you're living in a situation with uncertainty um, that's outside of your control in particular, you have two options. I mean, you can either consent to it or you can choose to fight it. And one's going to help you and the other's going to hinder you. But the choice is yours because it is in your control. So if you're finding it challenging to manage uncertain times, and if you're finding that to be quite overwhelming, I recommend and I encourage you to make a list of everything that you have control over. And that can act as a really good reminder that you really do have a lot of control of what's going on in your world. So for example, when I think about the things that I have control over, I think about my actions and my reactions to things. I think about how I treat myself, especially during this time, and how I'm treating others. You know, what boundaries do I need and what expectations do I have of myself and others? Um, how am I interpreting things? How am I investing my time? Am I being intentional every day? So that's the kind of stuff that are just really good reminders. At the end of the day, it's all about mindset. So you can choose to see any situation as an obstacle or an opportunity. But all of these small choices will determine the kind of success that you experience in your life. You need to be willing to lean in to discomfort and get comfortable being there. Great, thank you. Um, 
So the flip side, obviously, of, of, of the kind of success that you can open yourself up to um, is failure and the, the very real possibility that there may be setbacks and that there may be failures along the way. Um, you've obviously had your fair share of them and you've managed to overcome them. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how we can actually learn from setbacks and failures. People talk about it all the time, um, learning from failure. It's much, much easier said than done in my experience. Um, and, but you've said that being willing to fail is often the secret to success. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. I have really taken on um, a specific mindset when it comes to failure. I knew that starting a business wasn't going to be easy. It requires you to live in this like vulnerable space 24 hours a day, which being vulnerable in itself is really challenging as well. Um, however, I believe that failure is a prerequisite to success. So I don't, I don't know a single successful person, um, regardless of the industry or field that they're in, that hasn't had to face challenges along their way in order to get to where they want to be. Um, so I think that, for example, with me, in my first year, after a couple of months, I launched a workshop and I was super excited about it. I spent a lot of time developing it. And um, I was so excited to launch it as my first service offer with SheCan, and then no one signed up for it, not a single person. And it was in that moment that I said, you know, I'm gonna face so many experiences like this. So either today I can make the choice to be really hard on myself, you know, let myself live in this imposter syndrome world, go down the negative self-talk hole, um, or I could celebrate it and look at it as a check mark off my list as a stepping stone so instead i called my mom and i told her with excitement that no one signed up for my course and it was the first big failure i had experienced with my business so when she when she asked me why i seemed happy about it i told her that by failing i was one step closer to succeeding and because, you know, going back to our conversation about the why, because my why is so strong, my failure was seen as a blimp on my radar. And I knew if I continued to lead with vulnerability and a willingness to fail, that that attitude would propel me further and I would grow. So I can't be an example to women or I can't empower women if every time I face a failure or a roadblock, I quit. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have to lean into those moments and overcome them and use those as, you know, okay, check mark, first failed workshop, out of my way, done. Now my next one won't be a failure. I'll know how to market it differently or position it differently or do the work to, to make it excel and get a bunch of people signed up or whatever my goal may be. So it's really looking at failure as stepping stones as opposed to things that are setting you back. They're, they're propelling you forward as opposed to pulling you back. Excellent, thank you. Well, I think I think it might be useful to to, um, to hear from quest some questions from the audience if any anybody has any. Feel free to type them in the uh, the Q and A button there, um, and uh, we'll make sure that we get the questions answered. So we have one right now from from Marguerite. Um, have you found a difference between people's motivation before and after COVID nineteen in terms of coaching? Yeah, tremendously. Um, it's really interesting because it's kind of twofold. So I have some people, for example, like the women who are participating in my masterminds, they're all very ambitious women. They're like-minded. That's why they're part of a mastermind. Um, they're all looking at this opportunity as a time that they should be even more ambitious and conquering more. So, oh, I have extra time. I need to really be pushing myself. I need to learn more. I need, you know, everyone started baking bread. Um, and getting puppies and working out more from home and all these new things. Um, and my advice to them was to actually slow down. Mm -hmm. So just because there's space to be working from home more or a few more hours in the day to get things done, particularly for those who are laid off, it doesn't necessarily mean that they should put so much pressure on themselves to push forward. Um, and, and for me, the advice to that group of people was to actually take the time to just look in the mirror and see what is there and ask themselves whether or not they're happy with what they see. So instead of constantly striving to be better, do better, do more, 
um, to actually just take a moment to stop and learn to be really confident and comfortable with who they are in this moment without having to add more lessons or knowledge or skills to their tool belt. And then on the other side of it, there were also people that were feeling unmotivated because they weren't a part of their regular routine and they didn't have the normal get up, shower, you know, coffee, go to work. Um, they're learning how to work from home and how to get motivated in pajamas. So I would say to those people that that goes back to the mindset that goes back to let's remind ourselves what we have control over. Let's remind ourselves what our why is and why we're getting up every day. Because ultimately, whether I'm in pajamas or a business suit, my why doesn't change. And so my motivation shouldn't either. Excellent. Thank you. So that's a good segue into the next question that's just come in, actually. Um, if you don't really have a why yet, how do you suggest finding it? Was Jessica's question. Yeah, that's such a great question. Some people, um, how you can think of your why is it's almost like a baby. Sometimes it's just not conceived yet. Um, and that's okay. It takes time to get there. I think the best way to determine that or to help learn what that might be is to sit down and to ask yourself like what it is that makes you happy. Um, what do you enjoy doing? You know, I, I'll, I'll give my clients like worksheets and stuff to fill out. So it's hard to communicate it just vocally through, through this webinar, but there are things that you can do to just sit down and self reflect, ask yourself, what makes you happy? What are you most passionate about? Um, what are your skills? What are you really good at? And then taking that bit of information, you know, whether you bullet point listed it on a piece of paper and then saying, okay, how can these skills and these passions of mine transpire into something of a career? And whether that be something that you can develop on your own, or maybe you're really well suited for a role within a corporation, um, regardless of what that may be, and trying to find something that aligns with the things that make you happy. And once you know what makes you happy and what's important to you, that's where your why will be conceived. Okay. When you talk about making that list of skills, um, sometimes people are a little bit, they, you know, they can be, they can undersell to themselves the actual mm -hmm. skills that they have. They can list things that they've done or accomplishments they've checked off and miss the bigger picture skills. How do you help people see the, the broader skill sets that they may be unaware of so that they're, they're limiting themselves more than they need to be? For me, this is a really big one with my resume clients. Um, when I work with clients on developing a resume or cover letter, you know, we'll look at job descriptions that they're interested in and, and often they'll say, oh, I'm changing industries. Um, you know, let's say I'm hospitality. I'm, I'm doing some work for a general manager of a big corporate chain over here in restaurants. And he wants to make a shift and get out of the industry entirely. So he's like, I've been a general manager for restaurants for 10 years. You know, how am I going to make a shift? And it's really about your transferable skills. It's about getting creative. It's about looking at what you do have to offer and how those skills can be transferable to another role. Um, it's really good help when you ask other people. So within your network or you start networking or reaching out to people that are already in the field or the role that you want to be in and, you know, asking them for coffee or through email for a phone call, um, you know, to talk about what that role looks like and what skills are really required. And that gives you a better idea of the skills that you have and how you can adapt them to better meet the needs of that role or the career that you're looking to get into. So research is a really great starting point. Mm -hmm. um, and just learning to be objective with your skill set, learning to not only be honest with what you're capable of, but also not being afraid to be proud of the skills that you do have and having the confidence to say, I can absolutely look at this type, this list of skills that I have, and I will be able to apply it here. It's just a matter of asking yourself, okay, well, how, if I was a hiring manager, what would you tell me as to why this particular skill aligns with this particular job and always think of it from the perspective of wife the acronym wife what's in it for the employer I find a lot of students particularly coming out of school are looking for opportunities and they're really excited to tell the employer what great opportunity it would be for them to work for the company as opposed to telling the employer why they're a really good fit 
to work for them and what they're bringing to the table. So it's less about this would be a great opportunity for me because I want to be a coach one day and you're a coach. So I want to work with you because that's a great experience for me. And it's more about here's the skills that I have and here's how I can be an immediate asset with the skills that I have for you already. Great. Thank you. Excellent. Grayson's wondering, uh, what was the most difficult part of initially starting a business? And what was the easiest part that maybe you didn't expect would be so simple? Ooh, good question. Um, the hardest part was, oh my gosh, what's the hardest part? <laughs> the hardest part is probably not knowing exactly what to do when you first get started. And I feel like I can relate to people who are just about to launch their first business, but are afraid because they're like, I don't know how. And again, I wish someone had told me earlier, it's not about how it's about the why you'll figure it out. Um, and I did. So I would probably say figuring out, you know, how to launch like a business Instagram profile. I know how to do these things, but actually executing them because they're not revenue generating becomes more challenging. Um, so I would say executing tasks that are not directly revenue generating um, while you're already working 12 hours a day and then you have to sit down to do like your Instagram feed or something. Um, I would say it's those moments of, of working on things that aren't directly generating revenue. That's the hardest part because you feel like you could be doing something that is directly getting revenue, mm -hmm. um, but you have to get your name out there. And in terms of the easiest thing, I mean, I guess for me, it's, it's my motivation. I thought I would be more challenged to get up every day. I don't have another business. I don't have another income. Like I just went full force into this, like a crazy lady. Um, and I thought that I have a hard time with my motivation, but because my why is so hard, it does make it easy. You know, I have post-it notes on my office walls, you know, be intentional, <laughs> stuff like that. Like words of affirmation that, that remind me every day of why I'm here. But I thought there would be more days that I didn't feel like doing this and it just wasn't the case. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Kelly's wondering what experiences have you had that made you feel more confident or empowered in the workplace? And do you have any tips on this? More confident. Um, I think something that has made me more confident is caring less about what other people think. Um, it can be really challenging because sometimes when you start a business, you don't anticipate that you're going to have some really big supporters and you're going to have some people that don't support you at all. And sometimes it's kind of eye opening to learn who sits on what side. Um, but the more value that you give other people's compliments, like everybody likes being complimented, but the more value you give compliments, the more value and inevitably negative feedback will have on you as well. So what's helped me remain confident in what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, that I'm doing it is not listening to either, you know, taking the compliments with a grain of salt and don't get me wrong. I'm absolutely grateful and flattered by them, but I don't allow them to overcome like, or overtake how I feel about myself and what I'm doing. And that goes to say with the third party negative talk as well, I don't allow that to affect my confidence in what I'm doing because that's when negative self-talk happens and then that's when imposter syndrome will sneak in on you um, and then you think you're a total fraud but it's not the case mm -hmm. it's a normal feeling but I would say I would say to help with my confidence it's been the third party input and managing that and how I allow that to make me feel yeah that's fascinating I think a lot of us would sort of agree intuitively that we shouldn't pay attention to the to the to the people who don't like us um, but letting go of paying too much attention to the people who have great things to say about us is maybe the harder trick but but equally important it's interesting and it's all about how you feel about yourself at the end of the day and if you rely on other people to determine how you feel well you're going to have a lot of up and down days right yeah. um ryan's wondering has your why changed significantly over time and if so how did you adapt to new motivations Pre 2017, I always thought that I wanted, my why was always um, 
not maybe I don't know if it would be qualified as materialistic, but it was pretty superficial. Um, my why was just that I wanted to be, you know, a CEO of a big company and I wanted a corner office because that sounds sexy mm -hmm. and that sounds cool. And there's probably a good paycheck associated with that. Um, but having actually worked in the corporate field for a number of years um, and the corporate job I had in 2007 was what 17 was for a commercial painting company. And I just kind of realized I don't care about commercial paint. <laughs> so for me, yeah, absolutely. My why changed from I'll work for any corporation as long as I'm at the top and I'm willing to work really hard to get there. But it came down to my value alignment. I don't, I just didn't care about commercial paint. So my why immediately shifted to, you know, you're, pa you're really um, passionate about diversity. You're passionate about feminism. You're passionate about equal rights. Um, and motivating women. And that's where I kind of made the shift was, you know what, I'm going to do something that instead of focusing on my office and how tall the building is that, that I'm in and what my title is, is I'm going to actually focus my why on helping others because that matters to me more. Hmm. So it for sure took a shift. Thank you. Um, Caitlin's, wonder, or, uh, Caitlin's wondering, what were some important skills you developed working in a corporate job that helped you with running your own company? systems. <laughs> um, in the corporate world, particularly in the franchise world, if anyone's worked for a franchise before, um, everything is systemized. So there's a process for everything. There's a system for everything. In some of my previous work, I have champion systems. So companies, I do this for in my consulting now as well, is people will call me to come in to audit their company and then to look at how we can make things more effective and efficient. And usually that requires systems because the more systems you have in place, the less decision making you need to do throughout the day, um, which will also save you time as a leader. So I would say learning how to create more effective and efficient systems, taking that skill set and applying it to my business. So I have a system for this is when I do, you know, my monthly financials. This is how I execute a coaching call. These are the steps required. This is what it looks like when I have a new consulting client what is those what questions do i ask at the start how do i decide whether i want to take them on or not um so i would i would say systems for sure has been a corporate skill set that i learned that i've applied to my business and use it and hone those skills every single day great thank you um jessica's wondering do you think you would have found your real passion if you hadn't gone through working in a corporate setting first no hmm. i no, I think that everything that happened in my life, including the car accident, um, you know, was, was meant to happen. It's what required me to, to learn exactly what I wanted to do, or at least get me to a place that I was willing to take the plunge and do it. Um, it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to actually execute it. So I would say that, that, um, that definitely helped me get to where I am. Thank you. Did that answer the question well enough? I think I think it did. We'll let Jessica um, Jessica weigh in with another question if you don't think it did. Yeah. Um, perfect. Uh, Joanne uh, is wondering, um, as a postgrad, how do I position myself to stand out in the workforce? Um, would positioning myself as adaptable now be effective because everybody's adapting to these times? Um, that's a loaded question. I would say it depends on like what you're applying for, where, where your career goals are in terms of knowing how to make yourself stand out from other applicants. It really comes down to resume customization. Um, I tell all of my clients, they have to customize the resume. It, you can't submit the same resume for the two jobs. You just won't be effective. Um, or maybe you will, but not as effective as you could be. So I would say to really use this time to hone your resume development skills and learn how to really shine on that piece of paper. I mean, ultimately that's all you have to market yourself is your resume. Mm -hmm. And every day that you don't have your dream job, it's costing you a tons of money. So I would say, take the time now to find some jobs that you're really interested in and learn how to communicate that content on paper. Great. Because without the opportunity to land an interview, 
you don't, you, you're not going to get a hold of anyone to actually explain to them why you're going to be such an asset or why you're better than the next applicant. Um, and with that said, I would also have an answer prepared for that in an interview, just in case they asked. Excellent. Good. I'm just going to add to that because I know Joanne is a, um, is a Gustafson grad. Um, and so just building on this notion of adaptability, I think it's important for, for our students to recognize um, just how much flexibility and integrative thinking and adaptability they've learned as a result of the kind of program they've been in, where there's been integrated learning across different courses, there have been uh, experiences and co-op opportunities that bring together all sorts of different skills. Um, and so it's not just about adapting to these times like everybody else is, it's having built up adaptability and flexibility skills over a, an integrated course of study that allows you um, to demonstrate adaptability while in the program. And I think that that's something people really need to think about um, and make sure that they, they reflect in their resumes now. Okay, another question from Jessica. No suggestion that you didn't answer the other question. Well, this is a different question from Jessica. Uh, do you think it's better to settle for a job you're not thrilled about in order to gain some skills and keep yourself busy? Or is it better to wait for something you really want to do? I can't answer that question for you, Jessica. That is something that you have to answer for yourself. Um, everybody has bills to pay. Everybody has, um, you know, things that are required of them in order for them to live their life and live their life comfortably. Um, so that's really a decision that you have to make for yourself. If you don't know what you're wanting to do, um, then I would suggest getting out there and trying things. Um, you're not going to figure it out by sitting back and not doing anything. So if that's the case, then I would encourage you to get out there, get your feet wet, start trying stuff. Um, I've worked in so many different industries um, that I know who I enjoy working with and what matters more and things like that. So you really, I don't know what your finances look like. I don't know what responsibilities you have financially. Um, I don't know if you have kids or a family to raise um, or support. So I would say that that's a question that I, I can't give you a straightforward answer on. The, the only answer I can give you is only you know the answer to that. Good. Okay, thank you. A uh, question now from Brooklyn. Uh, do you feel that online videos and crafting one's online presence is critical in being noticed by employers? And if so, what platforms would you recommend? For example, LinkedIn, YouTube, etc. Um, again, this comes down to what you're wanting to do. So if you are looking for like a corporate job or to be honest, I would encourage everybody to be on LinkedIn and to have a strong LinkedIn profile. Recruiters are using LinkedIn more than ever to recruit. Additionally, Facebook is actually being used really strongly by recruiters now as well. So that's something to be mindful of. Um, not everything on Facebook you may want shared. So just be mindful of changing your name in some way that you're not easily searchable um, because employers are starting to use Facebook more and more. There are tools being offered now that help recruiters. So I would say LinkedIn is for sure the number one. In terms of what you're wanting to do, that's where you have to ask yourself, well, who am I targeting and what's the best channel to reach them? And it's the exact same from a company perspective. If you're running a business, you don't have to be on every social media platform just because there are, you know, 10 out there. Where, where's your client? Where's your target market? And how are you planning on reaching that person? You know, if you're wanting to be a YouTube star or finding somebody who produces YouTube videos, sure, go on YouTube, but you know, creating a Facebook account might not help you do that. So you have to kind of ask yourself, who am I trying to target? What is the purpose of these accounts? Excellent. Can I just pick up earlier um, near the beginning of our chat, you talked mm -hmm. about during COVID feeling reluctant to continue to market yourself because you were worried it might look pushy or grasping. Um, and then realizing that, no, this was actually an opportunity for you to serve clients um, and be useful to them during this time and that reaching out was actually helping them. Um, I'd imagine that a lot of the people listening as they think about trying to find a job are, are questioning, how do I get in touch with people during this time? Everyone's busy. Um, you, can, you can't, you know, we're obviously not meeting people at networking events at the moment. Uh, and they may have some concerns about imposing on people or bothering people if they try to seek them out electronically. What advice would you have for them? I would say if you don't ask, you won't know. Um, something that has really propelled my career 
from the get go is that I've never been afraid to ask, um, whether that be for more instruction or training, um, uh, more money, um, a promotion, you know, I, um, whether I can work from home remotely, whether somebody has time to mentor me or if I could take them for coffee. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? And that's kind of the mentality to set, like set yourself up with is, you know, I really want to reach out to this person. Well, I don't know if they're going to reply or if they're going to have time. Well, you don't know if you don't ask. So I would just say lean in and fire an email off and, and say, do you mind, you know, connecting with me or do you have time to connect or whatever it may be is, just to take the risk. What's the worst that can happen? They say no. You can say, okay, I tried. <laughs> so. Perfect. So we're nearing the end of our time together. Um, just give it a second in case anybody has one burning question they'd like to, they'd like to post now. And in the absence of that, um, maybe I will just sort of ask you to put yourself back in the position of realizing that your life was going to take a different course than you expected that it would. Um, and that, that might, mm -hmm. it sounds like that might well have been um, after the car accident when suddenly you had um, a realization that things were going to be different. Um, can you remember how you felt and how you managed to shift your mindset in that moment? And, and what kind of advice would you have for, for these students now around making that mindset shift when things seem to be, uh, life seems to be confronting them with challenges? Yeah, I mean, this goes back to, to your mindset. You know, you, you can control your thoughts. So when you're thinking about something a certain way, those thoughts are creating how you feel. And when you feel a certain way, your actions will reflect how you feel. So when you're feeling confident, you're like, yeah, I'm killing this. You're feeling good. Um, and you portray that physically when you're not, you know, you're, you, you don't. So your thoughts create how you feel and how you feel creates how you act. But what's created by your actions are your results. So, I could have chosen to been upset that my life had taken a detour and be, have a pity party, which don't get me wrong. Like I did for maybe the first few weeks. Um, but then there became a time where I had to, I had to make a choice and I was either choosing to live in that space and what was me and that's going to be the situation. Or I could say, you know what, I'm not going to let this define me. I'm not going to let this take over. I'm going to overcome it and I'm going to deal with the idea that things have changed and I'm going to be okay with that. It goes back to that piece about consent. It's mm -hmm. out of your control. It's already happened. You can choose to consent to it and move forward, finding meaningful solutions, or you can choose to live in that. But by doing that, you're hindering yourself. So I would encourage everybody to take this time to choose to be someone who sees this as an opportunity or any situation, always choose opportunity over obstacle. That's the mindset you need to be in. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lauren. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Um, and I hope uh, the students found this as helpful as I have. I um, was uh, oh, good. Very, very interested in what you said and found it incredibly useful. So thank you so much for this. Uh, next week, I will be back um, uh, same time interviewing Felipe Civita, uh, Felipe Civita who's another recent uh, Masters of Global Business graduate. Uh, so I do hope some of the students will join us again. Thanks once more, Lauren. And it was a pleasure. Thank talking you. To you. Thanks so much for being here and if the students have any questions they can always reach out to me um, either through my website shecanconsulting.ca or through email lauren at shecanconsulting.ca wonderful thank you so much okay thank goodbye, you everyone. bye